Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us again. And uh, today we're going to talk about, well, James is going to elaborate. But we're going to talk about who's running your show. That's right, Randy. And the question we're going to ask today is how you feel about the stuff that happens to you in your life. And specifically, we can divide ourselves up into a couple of different categories based on the answer to a simple question. When something good happens to you, is that something that you did? Is it good luck? Um, and before you answer that question, there's a corollary that has to be addressed, which is when something bad happens to you, was that just bad luck or was it also the result of your actions or lack of doing something? And I think that basic question of whether you feel like you have control over an agency over the things that happen to you in your life, good and bad, distinguishes people into three separate groups. And I can define them briefly if that's uh, going to be helpful. And I think whether you're in one of those three groups affects basically a lot of how you see the world and how you approach life and how you approach work. And it has pros and cons. And I suppose it's not just an intellectual exercise to see, oh, uh, that's interesting that you can put people into these three groups. And this is where I find myself. The question I think that people might want to be asking themselves is, can I change my approach to the world? And in other words, figure out how to move from one group to another. And if that uh, is possible, does it bring me some benefits? So this all sounds rather vague. Let me start to, with the explanation of the, the three different groups of people. And I noticed at first, Randy, when I was looking at people that were pretty successful, because there's a certain type of person who has had success in life and they take credit for their success. They say, ah, look how great and wonderful I am. These good things that happened to me were the result of my hard work. And probably that person did work hard, but there's an inconsistency in their approach because bad things also sometimes happen. And these successful people will say, oh, that bad thing that happened, that wasn't my fault. And they don't see any inconsistency whatsoever in that method of thinking. Everything good that happens is because of something they did. Everything bad that happens is because of something someone else did. And those kind of people used to annoy the crap out of me because I thought, well, hey, wait a minute, that just doesn't seem likely. And when you take credit for everything good that happens, but don't take responsibility for everything bad that happens, you're sloppy in your thinking, you come across as arrogant, you probably don't learn from your mistakes, all sorts of other potential negative consequences. So I used to be a little bit annoyed with such people. I called them the fair weather flock. When the weather's good, everything's great. When the weather's bad, it's not their fault. Uh, does that sound like the kind of a person that you have recognized in the workplace? Uh, do you understand the kind of personality I'm describing with that person? No, I, yeah, no, no, I see it. I see it. I see it in the military too. You know, the I understand exactly what you're talking about. You know, it's. It's. I think it's. I think. I don't think anyone who's listening would have a problem with that either. By the way, you don't need to be a huge success to belong in this group. It's really anybody, because I notice also since I started looking, uh, people who are less successful also have this method of thinking. Any good luck that goes their way is a result of their agency. Everything bad that happens is the result of someone else's fault. It's actually kind of hard not to see that here in the U.S., not to pick on the U.S., but there's a pretty heavy culture, and I think there's various reasons for it. But there's a strong culture of nothing bad that happens is my fault. But I don't want to. I don't want to dwell on that particular aspect of it. It's more just identifying the type, and we'll call them the fair weather flock. The second group, just for identification purposes, is much more laid back. I don't know if that's the right word. They basically think that life is random. Stuff happens. Uh, I was going to call this the shit happens group, but I used it in an article, <laughs> and I had to be a little bit more polite. So I called it the things just happen. Things just happen. And yes, sometimes you have good luck and sometimes you have bad luck and you might be in the right place at the right time, but your efforts don't have a significant impact on the things that happen to you. And that's a very, very different approach to life. I find uh, those people are sometimes happier because they don't take stuff personally. When something bad happens, they don't think the universe is out to get them. They're just like, eh, this thing happened. And by the same token, when something good happens, they don't assume it's the result of their individual brilliance. It's just, eh, you know, this time the cards worked in my favor. 
that's an interesting group of people. I don't find a ton of people in that group, but they, they're, they're out there and they're interesting for their approach to life. The third group is uh, what I will call the I make things happen. This person is consistent in the sense that they take responsibility, not just for the good things, but also the bad thing. They take responsibility for everything. And that has downsides as well. So if the fair weather flock only takes credit for good stuff, the I make things happen group takes responsibility for bad stuff. But that's also not necessarily a super healthy way to approach the world, because if we're honest, not every bad thing that happens is the result of your actions. Sometimes you were doing everything right and you still got into the car accident or you did everything right and your company went through a restructuring or you did everything right and the bullet went this way, not that way, you know? And so I used to say, so the question then that I wanted to explore with you, Randy, is, is it better or worse to be in one of those three groups? And should you try to steer yourself towards thinking, okay, um, if I can, this is how I'm going to approach life. And I honestly haven't been able to come to a conclusion. All I've been able to do is come to a little bit of pros and cons. But let me stop there and ask you, have you also identified people in the second two groups of the people who just take everything as it comes and then the people who take everything personally, good and bad? No, I can identify with people in my life that fall into all three of these categories. And I think that um, I there's a really popular book, uh, New York Times bestseller called Extreme Ownership was written by a Navy SEAL called jo Jocko Willink. And he's talking about accepting ownership of your mistakes, uh, even though it might affect your career, just so you can do the right thing and learn and, and have people learn from it. And he, most of his examples were in wartime where people's lives are at stake. Right. So if you don't, especially, you know, in his circumstances in uh, Iraq, if he didn't accept the responsibility, nothing would have changed and more people would have died, you know, and maybe in the corporate world or even the civilian world in your everyday life, it's not a life or death question, but does that mean your friends and family because you and or people in your company will lose money, your friends and family won't learn their lessons. So they'll be basically in the same situation of you. And this is only, you know, the bad luck piece that you're talking about, obviously. Um, but uh, I, I think, I think all this does apply. And the reason he wrote this book, because it does apply to the real world, you know, there, you have to learn lessons to get better and to stop people from suffering. Um, and that doesn't mean you can't accept the good as well, which is also a lesson. It's a good lesson. So, hey, this is a good lesson. We should add this to our best practices so that, you know, once I'm, if I'm not here or if I move on, people will know that's the best practice that work with you and work with us. And we should continue to do that. And this goes back to something we talked about in a different podcast with, with the military, specifically the army. I don't, I don't know about the other services, but I think it's very similar where they have the act after actions review, the AAR where after every, you know, task, after every, you know, practice mission, rehearsal, even every military activity we do, we come back, we clean our equipment, get ready, you know, for a counterattack or any kind of combat that might be coming up or, you know, be ready for anything. And then we'd all assemble in a room and say, okay, what did we, what went wrong? What went right? You know, and why did it go wrong? Or why did it go right? And how do we reproduce or improve the rights? And how do we stop from doing the wrong or mitigate it or try to so that next time we can see if what we're mitigating, what we did to mitigate it worked or not. And then just kind of build on that and get better and better. And I think this is one reason. This is like a thing that's, I don't think it's only unique to the American army, but it's definitely not common in a lot of armies that I've worked with in South America in Africa, where the leaders don't take the input of the other soldiers and don't want to look bad. And in this case, the American officers and leaders don't want to look bad either. But the supervisors are like, let's do an AAR and let everyone have some input. And so it's a lot of times it'll end up being the supervisor defending his 
his, it's not supposed to be that way, but sometimes you'll have them being defensive. Well, we did that because of this, this, this. That's not the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise is, was this a pro or a con? And how do we fix the the cons and and keep the pros? And how do we re, 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 redo the pros? And I think that, you know, as far as luck's concerned, luck's always out there, right? But I, I think we've talked about this in another episode, which is you can make your own luck or you can make it more possible that you're going to be lucky by if just the simple example is I can not take responsibility and show up, you know, out of shape for basic training, or I can say, Hey, I'm going to get in shape because I know this is a thing. And then I get there and then people notice me because I'm in shape and no one else is. So I get special privileges. I get awards. Am I lucky? Oh, he just likes you. Does he like me? Or he just knows that I'm not going to fail the PT test in two weeks and be a, you know, a bad mark on his career because he did not everyone passed or something like that. I mean, this, there's, there's certain circumstances where um, we, you can set yourself up to get, I, to get the luck that you you're looking for or not looking for. And I've talked a lot and I've talked about a lot of topics. And so go ahead and summarize over to you, James. <laughs> <laughs> I do like that you tied back to the after action review. For me, that fits with a overarching theme of ours, Randy, which is challenge your assumptions. Do and be mindful if there's an activity you want to get better at, if there's a bad outcome you want to avoid, being mindful at a point when it's appropriate. You can't always do it in the, the heat of the moment. So the after action review is actually a nice concept. Just ask yourself the question. Well, okay, do I understand what are the factors that contributed to this good outcome? And do I understand what are the factors that contributed to a bad outcome? It's so helpful to do that because what it does is it causes you to break out of the automatic mode, whichever of the three methods you're in. If you're in that middle group and you say, yeah, stuff just happens. Well, really? Really? Your actions had no impact whatsoever on what happened to you? Like the person who shows up to basic training, never having done a push-up in their life or run a single step, right? That just happened. Well, no, you, you made some choices along the way. And so that's, I think, what you mean when you refer to you can influence luck. It's the question of whether you really think you have an impact on the stuff that happens. Mm -hmm. I also like to summarize what I heard you say, uh, and a really good point, and it comes back to the description you gave of the book Extreme Ownership. And I felt prey to this as well, which is focusing exclusively or very heavily on mistakes because mistakes are painful. You don't want them to happen again. So uh, I used to keep a mistake log where every time something painful, embarrassing happened at work and I got in trouble, I was like, all right, let me think about this one. I'll write down the circumstances. How did it happen? Why did it happen? What did I learn from it? And how can I see that it doesn't happen again? That was really helpful to me. But now that I think back on it and consider our discussion here, Randy, it probably would have helped me to keep a success log as well to challenge my assumptions about why I was successful because maybe it was my doing, maybe it was other things, maybe I could be even more successful if I focused on what were the reasons why. So it's one thing to say in you know, two of these groups, the, the fair weather flock and the I make things happen group, we take responsibility for our success, but you can do that without thinking about the reasons for why you were successful. So yeah, the maybe for me, the takeaway here is it is helpful occasionally to challenge your assumptions and to ask yourself, well, why did this good thing happen? And why did this bad thing happen? And then tease out how much was the result of your own actions versus luck. So that that seems like a, the after action review applied to, to everyday life seems like a very potentially helpful concept. Would you do it with everything? Would you do it with big things? How do you decide when to apply an after action review if the military is not forcing you to do it after every single thing? Uh, I mean, as a freelancer uh i'm responsible for everything my business does or doesn't do i mean i'm not my only employee right so if i'm not making money is it bad luck or am i not looking for clients am i not am i not analyzing what's working and not working and and am i not looking at any feedback from my clients and saying oh i, I should change that because five clients have complained about that since i started or something like that so to me it's always a feedback loop I'm always asking for testimonials from clients. I'm always having a conversation like how could, what would have helped you more in these situations? 
Um, I also just give you my freelance business a look. I, you know, quarterly I'm looking at where I'm comparing where I am this year with where I was last year, which where I was a lot year before, what I was doing differently. Was that, is that improving my business or not improving my business? So that's, I mean, that's how I, that's how I apply the AAR concept, I guess. Um, we've also, I, I do have a contract, a partner that I work with on some, on some of my editing clients. Some of my clients aren't happy with what we've given back to them. Either they don't, either we were too harsh and we weren't empathetic enough, or they didn't want to accept the truth. But that's what my partner and I talk about. Like if they said, hey, this is the worst. I actually had someone this last year say, this is the worst feedback I've ever gotten. You're completely wrong. I got nothing from any of your 20 page report that you spent 20 hours on. I mean, she didn't say that, but that's what I gave her. Uh, there's not one in piece of information that was useful to me. And, and I said, I was like, I'm sorry. So Laura, my partner and I had a conversation like, A, I don't, I just want to give her money back. I mean, we, we, we earned that money, but whatever, if she, if she doesn't think that she got anything from it, then I, I, as a, as a business, I don't see any reason why we just don't give her money back and move on. Cause she's the only customer out of 50 customers you've had that's ever done this. So, you know, if this becomes a habit and we'll have to reassess and say, you know what, Hey, we need to do our contracts better. And if, if you, if you accept the, if you go to this far into this, to the process, then you don't get your money back or something. But for this case, I think we just give it back and move on and maybe she'll still be happy and not give us a bad review, a horrible review. And then the second part was what, what do you think ticked her off? And we kind of looked at our comments and we were, we were rushing it and we were, I mean, it's hard if you're not having a conversation, like she didn't want to have a conversation like on a zoom call. So if you're having that call and you're like, what bothered you with this? Oh, okay. I see. Well, that's not what we intended. You know, what we, what our intent was, was to do this, this, and this, and, and here's some solutions to that, as opposed to we wrote our notes kind of rapidly because it was a, a, a it was a, not a very significant part of our, it was a very small job, a small gig. And so we, we gave her our feedback, but maybe we were a little bit brusque and rude. I mean, it could be interpreted as rude because when you write, just like when you write text or when you write an email, depending on how you frame it, it could mean, Hey, great job. And it could mean like, Oh, you know, you did this one thing wrong. And it could mean like, Oh, you you're challenging me. So, and writing is very emotional for the writers, for the authors, right? They think they're writing the best thing ever. And if you comment on that and say, well, I don't think it's the best thing ever, but I think you could improve it. Some people get offended. Um, anyway, so the moral of the story to get it way off topic is that my partner and I do an AAR, especially on this specific one, which is kind of the only bad review we've ever had and said, how do we avoid this? How, what do you think really, you know, turned her off of the whole process that no one else got turned off this way? And, and how, how do we, and what, how are we going to uh, engage with this in the future if it happens again? So that's how I use the AAR process. Uh, and, and as far as my everyday life, I guess if you're talking about it, you know, trying to improve my life and, you know, I've done it in my personal finances, like, hey, what do I spend money? I mean, like I'm kind of an Excel geek. So I'm like, what am I spending my money on? And this actually happened last year. I was taking Ubers everywhere because they're cheap, relatively speaking. But cheap is still Five, four or five bucks every time I do it. And if I do it twice a day, that's 10 bucks. And if you add that all up, that's 300, you know, but then I, then I'm like, what, what, how do I use these buses and where do they go? What's going on? I've been here for three years, never used a bus and it, you know, it stops right out in front of my house. And, uh, and so I figured it out and now I'm paying 75 cents twice a day instead of five bucks twice a day. So I just looked at, you know, it's just me trying to assess where I'm spending my money and if it makes sense for me to do that, if there's a reason for me to do that, or can I do it a different way? So that's how, that's how, that's the other way I use it. So the method you're describing is, there's two things about that, that I like that uh, first you can focus on things that are important to you. So this is the way I make my living. I better apply some of my AAR thinking to the aspects of my job that are important or anything that's important to you also in your private life. But the example you just gave 
is also nice to illustrate that you can apply this method of thinking about why you're doing things and how they work also on really small stuff and just make incremental improvement. That ties to something that I did a lot when I was leading a legal team is I would introduce a small change and I would call it deliberately an experiment. I'd say to my team, look, we're just going to try this out and see what happens. And I don't know if it's going to be better or not, but it's a low cost, quick thing that we can do that we can turn on or turn off, you know, a, a new way to do a contract review or a new way to negotiate with customers or a new way to do, you know, some little thing that would have a big impact if we could make an incremental improvement. And some worked and some didn't. And calling it an experiment uh, is a way to say, I don't know the answer. I'm going to keep an open mind and I'm just going to check this thing out. You might have found that the bus, while cheaper, took two hours to get a place that took you 15 minutes to get. And so there was a trade-off in a way that you didn't like. But yeah, a little harm done. You tried it out and now you learned something. The other thing I was struck by when you were describing your interaction with one of your clients is maybe this is just me. So I'll, I'll try out what I have learned from such experiences. And that is, uh, you know, I came from a very logical method of thinking in my schooling, right? So law school and business school. And, you know, if I have this input, I get that output and I can, you know, if I follow the rules in this way, then I'm going to be in compliance with the law very clear set of understanding of actions and consequences. And I believe that the world in all of its complexity does not always follow linear rules or logical rules because people are effing crazy is what I would like to say. <laughs> and I learned that less in my main job than in my first side job, which was teaching students at the university, taught law students, smart group, also very logical as a general rule. I liked teaching them. I like to teach them a lot still now. But I found when I was getting my class evaluations, I think I've told you about this before, a certain percentage of them would come back and say, eh, didn't like him. He was stupid. Or, you know, it was a dumb class or some other hurtful comment in my view that didn't reflect the reality of what I had delivered because I worked hard to deliver a good lecture. And the only conclusion I could draw I used to take that very seriously and do my after action review and say, oh my God, you know, how do I get better and avoid that? And then it happened a couple of times, but it was always about a different topic, right? So someone complained about this and then someone complained about that. And then it was, you know, there was no thread running through it that I could detect anyway. And my conclusion from that, perhaps as a way to protect my ego and to be able to move on was, hey, it's not me, it's them. Sometimes you're just going to come across a person who is crazy for lack of a better word i'm not saying someone who doesn't like my work is necessarily crazy but i, I but most mean, likely yeah it's the <laughs> most likely uh, conclusion no i just mean that uh you don't control every variable it's not a question of luck so much as sometimes people just see the world differently so that is you know this is the reason why everything isn't perfect everywhere all the time because there's there's variables you just can't control. You could have done, you could have planned the best mission absolutely possible and done everything correctly from your side, but something still goes wrong because that's the way the world works. It's either mechanical or environmental or oftentimes people. So all I want to say with this is that you can go a long way towards following the processes that we've described, but I, I don't think it's appropriate to take 100% responsibility, the extreme ownership for absolutely everything that happens. It's a helpful attitude to have, but if it makes you feel bad, right? If you say, oh my God, I'm a failure because I couldn't get to 100% approval rate, that's not an appropriate response because it really isn't 100% in your control. I think uh, I th I, my interpretation of extreme ownership is, especially this guy, this guy, this guy's book, if you haven't read it, was focused on leaders is it's your responsibility to figure out what's going right and what's going wrong, fix what's going wrong, and make sure that the people the people that are influencing the right things are getting the credit and also that we keep those in place. And if it requires you, if it was in some way your fault or you, your team's fault and your supervisor for the team, it's your responsibility to get to the bottom of what caused it. And then what are some options for mitigating it? So it's not a problem next time, if possible. 
And I think that's what, I think that's what it, it's more that than saying, this is all my fault. And, uh, and, and I take full responsibility for it. Cause that doesn't solve the problem by you just saying it's all my fault. Then maybe a little bit of the problem by, you know, other people aren't, you're going few, <laughs> at least he said that, but, uh, but, but, um, okay. Yeah. I, so I think I, that, all right. So that, that, that's helpful. Thanks for that clarification. And I do think there's a benefit. It, it's worth pointing out that uh, people's emphasis on the mistakes and when things go wrong is correct because a lot of uh, emotions are aroused in any context, in your private life, in the business setting, and I'm sure also in the military when there's a mistake and there's been a big uh, problem. It's an emotional moment. And the common response, the instinctive response for a lot of people is to be defensive. Someone comes and says, well, you F that up. And your first response is to get your, your back up and say, well, no, I didn't. It wasn't my fault because, and then there's 10,000 legitimate reasons why it wasn't entirely your fault or there were other people at fault. That is a natural instinct, but it's not always a helpful one. Just the apology and the acknowledgement of the mistake, that first part, which you said helps a little bit, it, it actually helps defuse what is otherwise a difficult exchange where people don't learn anything. Your boss comes and he wants to yell at you because you messed something up. If you get defensive, the boss is going to try to prove his point and you're just going to get, you know, put on the, the back foot. I learned, took me a while, but I learned that just listening when the boss is yelling at you, one, and two, saying, oh, I'm sorry, I messed up. I'm going to try and figure out how not to do that again. That takes away all of the momentum and the energy, you know, they, you, because you've demonstrated, oh yeah, I recognize there was a mistake. I recognize I had a role to play in that mistake. All by itself, that's a really healthy attitude. The second part of it though, which I like, and which I also tried to do with my mistake blog that I talked about was, okay, I did say, sorry, I acknowledge that this thing happened and that I played a role in it. How now can we learn from it? That, that is where the real value comes. Because genuinely, if you can learn from your mistakes or the bad situations that you found yourself in, you don't make the same mistake again. It's not that you'll never make another mistake because you will. There's an infinite number of ways to make mistakes. But that sort of attitude of saying, all right, well, what 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 can we learn from this? Um, it really is a helpful, a helpful way to approach things. So the trick is along the way to find a way to do it with humility and not to have it damage your ego. Just because you make mistakes doesn't make you a bad person, doesn't make you a failure. It just means you're trying difficult things, right? Putting yourself in difficult situations. So so this isn't the point of this podcast. However, it, I think it's important to say that, you know, as a supervisor, when you see something happen beneath you uh, and you see people pointing fingers or taking responsibility, and it's it's a you know it al it's almost a good weeding out process to see how people are affected by good things or bad things. If they're like, I yes, I did all this, and not giving any credit to the people below them, or at, it wasn't it wasn't really my fault. You know, Jolene, you know, if they're passing on the responsibility, even if they're taking responsibility, are they have they have already thought of mitigations? It, you know, if someone comes to you is like, hey you know, maybe even comes there before you address it, you know, you know about it, but they're like, walk into your office, like, hey, I want to talk to you about, you know, what happened the other day with blah, blah, blah. And uh, my team got together. And, you know, we realized it was a problem, and it shouldn't have happened. But we we can't, we have some solutions and some mitigations. And I just want to talk them over with you. That is a lot more proactive, and a lot better chance that <laughs> ideally, you're not going to get fired or, you know, reprimanded because you're trying because ideally, as a leader, as a supervisor, you, you probably made mistakes in your life and you probably need to acknowledge that mistakes are going to be made. And that's how people learn and how they, I think it's more important to how those mistakes and how the, how the good things are the reactions that people have to them that show you their character, uh, character flaws or, or, or the good things about their character are kind of a ways to, to look at that situation rather than, you know, the bottom line sometimes. So listening to you talk, Randy, it strikes me that we need to come up with a fourth group because none of the three groups are doing it exactly correctly. The person who takes credit for the good and no responsibility for the bad is missing an opportunity. The person who takes ownership entirely of the good and the bad is taking on too much responsibility for the randomness that sometimes occurs. 
and the person in the middle who thinks everything is just luck um, is also missing an opportunity. So I don't know what we call this fourth group of person, but it's maybe the person who mindfully approaches life and says, yes, stuff does happen randomly, both good and bad, but I can influence it. I can influence my luck, as we've said before, and as you reminded us of today. What do we call that fourth group? He's called the uh, Passionately Wrong Podcast Listener. Oh, yes. Very nice. <laughs> Very nice. The PWCL. <laughs> Wouldn't it be PWPL? I don't know. I don't know. What did I say? C? I don't, it's, uh, I don't know what the C was. Cast? Yeah, yeah, you're right. That's why you're the lawyer. <laughs> All right. So that was probably the main point that I think I wanted to address today, which is that people probably from their nature and how they grew up in life tend towards one of these extremes in terms of how they approach what happens to them. And it's probably a useful exercise to think a little bit about which group you fall in and to, I like the idea if we had to give specific advice of saying, think about conducting little action after action reviews in your life. If something good has happened and something bad has happened in an area that's important to you and you care about, just go through that little process of saying what went well and why and what didn't go well and why and what can we do differently next time. And if you're looking to make what can we do differently next time easier, cast it in the frame of just trying a little experiment out. It's not a fundamental change to the type of person you are or what you're doing. It's just a test to see if something different might make a big difference in your life. So with that, we hope we've given you an idea to try something out that might help you challenge your assumptions and lead to you being passionately wrong a little less often. And thanks for uh, listening to us. Have a nice day. Thanks, everyone. We'd love to hear what you think. So please comment on the show with your thoughts. We read all of your comments. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for subscribing. See you next time. We'd love to hear what you think. So please comment on the show with your thoughts. We read all of your comments. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for subscribing. See you next time.